does care for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. He surely does. Thank you all so very much. I'm going to do something a little different today in that I'm going to skip Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 from now uh, and instead cover Daniel chapter 12 verses 4 through 13 instead. Lord willing, uh, we will finish with the verses I'm skipping today next week. So I'm not going to skip them for good. We'll come back. But the reason why I'm going to go out of order is because the events in Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 happen after what is described in our text today in Daniel 12 4 through 13. At the same time, uh, Daniel chapter 12 verses 4 through 13 is a little bit more closely connected to the end of Daniel chapter 11, which we looked at last week. So that's the reason why we're going to go a little bit out of order. But in chapter 11, Daniel was told many things which would happen in the future, even going deep into the time between the Old and New Testaments. Uh, much of these prophecies in Daniel chapter 11 culminated in a king named Antiochus IV, who was so wicked, he was actually a lesser antichrist. He was that bad. But from there, the prophecies in Daniel chapter 11 shift from this lesser antichrist to the final antichrist of the end times, and that's who we looked at last week. So let's see what Daniel chapter 4 verses, or sorry, Daniel chapter 12 verses 4 through 13 have to add. Daniel chapter 12 verses 4 through 13. If you would please rise as we read God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word. Daniel chapter 12 verses 4 through 13. This is what it says. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and the other on that river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. And then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. This is the word of our Lord to the prophet Daniel. You may be seated. Well, as we've talked about before, Daniel chapter 10 through Daniel chapter 12 is in many ways Daniel's retirement prophecy. This is the last thing God tells Daniel and has him write down before uh, he dies. And in this final prophecy revealed to Daniel by God through angels, as this prophecy is coming to an end, 
Daniel is told to shut up the words and to seal the book until the time of the end. Now, what does that mean? Well, to, to seal a book, or in this case specifically a scroll, back then it meant to keep it closed and its contents hidden. In our day and age, uh, it would be like going to a bookstore and uh, you, you see a brand new book and you want to buy it and you might want to look at it a little bit before you buy it, but you can't because why? It's shrink-wrapped. Uh, you, can't, you can't look at it. That's basically what we're talking about here. It's like covering a book with shrink wrap. Now, what's interesting about this is while Daniel is told to seal up his prophecy until the time of the end, it's very interesting when you get to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. He's actually given the opposite instructions. In Revelation 22.10, John is told, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And so Daniel is told to seal his prophecy, whereas John is told not to. Why is that? Well, the book of Revelation gives us the answer. In Revelation chapters 5 and 6, I won't get into all of what that's about today, uh, but very fascinating chapters. In those chapters, we, we see that Jesus breaks open the seals. Now, that means a lot of different things, especially when it comes to judgments and the end times, and I'm not going to get into that today. But besides that, part of what Jesus breaking the seals means is the coming of Jesus has an effect on how we see the Bible's prophecies, okay? So, before Jesus came, the first time, the things revealed here in Daniel were a lot harder to understand, okay? For example, when we looked at Daniel chapter 11, we saw that a lot of those prophecies in Daniel chapter 11, there were 73 of them, a lot of them had to do with an empire that didn't exist when Daniel was alive, the Seleucid Empire. But when Jesus came, by the time Jesus came, that empire by which a lot of those prophecies were fulfilled had come and gone. And so a lot of people in the time of Jesus' first coming could look back at Daniel chapter 11 and say, Oh, I kind of understand that now. Whereas Daniel and the Jews who were alive during his time, they're like, I don't know what this means. And so the coming of Jesus makes a difference. Uh, when Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation, this terrible thing that happens in the temple, which causes the sacrifices to not happen for a long time. When Daniel was alive, that hadn't happened yet. Daniel and other Jews in his lifetime, when Daniel writes about that, they're reading it, and they're like, okay, I know this is what God's Word says, but I don't know what that means. When Jesus comes the first time, it's different. Uh, Antiochus the Epiphanes, the, the, the lesser Antichrist, had already committed an abomination of desolation, causing sacrifices to cease in the temple for an extended period of time. And so when Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation, people at that time were like, oh, Jesus, I, I kind of know what you're talking about now because that's happened. It hadn't happened in Daniel's time. And so the first coming of Jesus makes a difference in helping us to understand, better understand, the Bible's prophecies. And this is why Daniel's prophecy was sealed at first, whereas John's was unsealed right away. That said, there are still aspects of both Daniel's prophecies and John's which are difficult to understand, and Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 says some will not be fully understood until the time of 
the end. However, as we get closer to the end and certain things start falling into place, Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 also says that as we're running back and forth, do you ever feel like you're just running back and forth sometimes? I, I think the whole world just is just running back and forth. Uh, as we're, so it's funny that the Bible talks about the end times as a time where people are just running back and forth. Uh, we really are. And at a rate and at a pace that no other generation prior to us has. God knew what he was talking about when he said we'd be running back and forth all the time. We really are. In a day and age when we're running back and forth and knowledge increases, we're, we're definitely living in an age where knowledge has increased tremendously with the internet and now with AI. Oh my goodness, we, we have more access to information. We have more knowledge at our fingertips. I was going to grab my cell phone and it's right there. Uh, shows I'm, my mind is not in the right spot. But, but uh, uh, we have more knowledge at our fingertips than ever before. Uh, and so it's, it's so interesting that the Bible talks about the end times like we see them right now. A time when people are running back and forth all the time and a time when knowledge is increasing. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's super interesting. But in the meantime, even as things are starting to fall in place more and more for the end to come, some humility is needed when seeking to interpret these end times prophecies. As we move to verses 5 through 6, Daniel sees two more angels besides the one that has been talking with him already. And they are on opposite river banks, with one being further upstream than the other. The river, of course, in question is the Tigris River, mentioned back at the beginning of this vision in Daniel chapter 10, verse 4. And one of these angels asks the other, who is clothed in linen, further upstream, when will, the, when will be the end of these extraordinary things? Not even the angels know when the end times are going to take place. We don't know when the end is going to take place. The angels don't know when the end is going to take place. Jesus, in his humanity, did not know when the end was going to take place. He knows it now. He knew it as soon as he... Uh, reclaim more of his glory for himself uh, in the resurrection. But uh, even the angels are like, when is this stuff going to happen? When is, when is all of this going to go down? And then, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, the other angel responds. And we're told, it's super interesting, did you catch this? He raised his right hand to swear an oath to heaven. But then he also raised his left hand also. You know, usually when we take an oath, like when I took an oath to join the Air Force, for example, you raise your right hand. This angel raises both his right hand and his left hand. This is serious. This is a doubly serious oath. And he swears by him who lives forever, which is God. And raising both hands in an oath to God, the angel says that the end will come after a time, times, and half a time, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Let's break this down. Super important. If he, right, if he raised his right hand and his left hand, this has got to be important. What does this mean? Well, first, that the time, times, and half a time. We've seen that phrase before, actually, in Daniel 7, 25. What does it mean? Well, here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, uh, it's used in the context of 1,290 days in Daniel 12, 11, as well as 1,335 days in Daniel 12, 12. Uh, super, y'all have heard me say this before, but a super important thing to always remember when you're reading your Bible and you're trying to understand it and you come across something and you're like, I don't know what that means. Look at the context. Look at the other verses around the verse that you have a question about and see if the other verses around it answer your question. Okay? 
it turns out that the time, time, and half a times makes a lot more sense when we look at it in light of those numbers. Because later on, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, it mentions that same phrase again. A time, times, and half a time. And it mentions it in the context of Revelation 12, 6, which mentions, which mentions 1,260 days. And so all of these numbers, 1,260 days, 1,290 days, 1,335 days, what do those numbers all have in common? Well, what they have in common is they are all very close to three and a half years in length, okay? Uh, on our modern Gregorian calendar, the calendar that if you had a cell phone, updated itself, daylight savings time last night, and man, I really wish we'd get rid of that, but that's another story for another day. Uh, but uh, our, our modern Gregorian calendar, three and a half years is 1,278 days, okay? And because these three numbers... 1,260, 1,290, 1,335. Because those three numbers are very close to that, it seems best to me, and, and not just me, but many other studies, people who study prophecy, it seems best to see the time, times, and half a time as a time being one year, times being two years, and half a time being a half a year. So one plus two plus a half is three and a half. Uh, so this appears to be referring to the time, time and half a time, referring to three and a half years. And, and even though there is some debate about this, I think this is compelling evidence to see that as three and a half years. And if that's the case, and I think it is, uh, Daniel chapter 12 verse 7 is saying that all these prophecies that he's been talking about with the, the final end times antichrist with the abomination of desolation all these other things that we looked at last Sunday Daniel chapter 12 verse 7 is saying all of this is going to happen during the last three and a half years prior to the second coming of Jesus and during this time, what else is going to happen? What else are we told? We are told that the power of the holy people will be completely shattered. Completely shattered. Now, again, like with a lot of prophecies, it's funny, I heard Ray Comfort talk about this the other day. He's like, whenever a preacher gets up to talk about prophecies, get ready to have stones thrown at you because somebody's going to be mad. Because everybody interprets prophecies differently. So you can even be saying what's right, and hopefully I am, and I don't know that I, I, I try to get this right. I take this seriously. But again, as I've shared with you, there's some things I'm like, I don't know if this means this or that, and I try to be honest about that. But it doesn't matter. Whenever, whenever any preacher, any teacher gets up to speak about prophecy, get ready to have stones thrown at you because somebody's going to disagree. And that's okay. That's just the way it is. But uh, Bible-believing Christians, unsurprisingly, are divided as to who the holy people are in this verse. Is it Israel? Is it the church? Is it both? And there's disagreements. Let me tell you what I think, and you can take for it as you will. You can think I'm wrong, and that's okay. But as I study the scriptures... I think the holy people must at least include the Jews to some extent. If it's not the Jews completely, if it's maybe a mix of the Jews and the church, I don't know. But I think it, it must include the Jews to some extent, and here are my reasons. They come from the Bible. They come specifically from Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, it says this. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, 
and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city, because then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. So when I read that, to me that sounds like the power of the holy people being completely shattered, which is what Daniel talks about, when what? In the middle of it, the Lord returns and he saves them. Okay? So that, that, that's what I am understanding there. I think that this is what Daniel's talking about, what Zechariah is, is referring to what Daniel's talking about. And then Zechariah has more to say. In Zechariah 12, 9 through 10, he adds, It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And then they shall look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. What an amazing prophecy, not only about the second coming, but remember Zechariah is writing about the one who's pierced. He's writing about a son who is pierced before that happens to Jesus on the cross, hundreds of years before that happens to Jesus on the cross. Zechariah talks about this. He's so obviously talking about Jesus coming to save the people of Jerusalem and then those who did not believe, the Jews who did not believe mourn for him. They're like man, why didn't we follow him? We should have been following him this whole time. But they finally repent and get on the right track. Um, amazing prophecy. Amazing prophecy. Um, so for these reasons I think that the power of the holy people being completely shattered, it at least partially refers to Israel. And it is, isn't it something that we're going through a time right now with the war, with Hamas, and, and the tensions that are rising uh, there, uh, that uh, the, the nations gather against Jerusalem. I'm not saying that this is going to lead to the end times. I, I'm saying it might. I don't know if it will for sure. But it is something we need to keep an eye on. It is definitely something we need to keep an eye on because these are the things that the Bible says are going to happen before the end. The power of the holy people will be completely shattered. But then Jesus is going to come save them. So we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. Uh, but, but again, in Daniel 12, 8, Daniel is being told all this stuff, and he's like, man, I just don't understand. He, he's living in the time he's living in, and he doesn't see some of the things that even we're seeing right now. And he's like, I don't understand this. Because even the prophet Zechariah, he doesn't begin his ministry until about 15 years after Daniel's ministry ends. But Christ removes some of this mystery. The first coming of Jesus makes a difference in how we see prophecy. Uh, uh, I think about Romans. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. I think it also speaks to these things. What does it say in Romans 11, 25 through 27 in the New Testament? It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion." that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And again, I know there's a lot of disagreement as to how to look at this, but... To me, all of these passages 
sound a lot like the holy people in Daniel 12, 7. Uh, it, it includes Israel to at least some degree, but because their power will be shattered as the Antichrist leads all other nations against them, Jesus will come and he will save Jerusalem and all the Jews who witness this salvation will finally, finally put their faith and trust in him. Daniel 12, 9 once again talks about how the words of this prophecy are closed up and sealed uh, until the time of the end. But again, just think about the times we're in. As we're getting closer to the end, we understand this better, don't we? We really do. As Christians, we don't like it. I definitely don't like it. But the sad reality is, is we see a growing hatred for Israel even in this country, don't we? Yes, we do. We do. The Bible kind of says that's going to happen. We don't want it to happen, but the Bible kind of indicates it's going to happen. Uh, and so we can understand, even if this war that's going on right now ultimately doesn't lead to the end, and, and it very well may not. Please don't walk out of here saying the, you know, the war going on right now is the sign of the end times. Maybe it is. I don't know. I don't know. But... We can understand, regardless of how that turns out, you and I can understand how sometime in the future there's going to be a final Antichrist who rules the world and he will be able to lead all nations against Israel and completely shatter her power. We can see how that could happen, given what's going on in our world today. But then Jesus himself will intervene. When America doesn't have Israel's back, and I hope we always do, but it kind of looks like there will become a time when we don't. Even when we don't have Israel's back, Jesus will. Amen. Jesus will. And Daniel 12.10 speaks of what, Lord willing, we will cover in Daniel 12, 1 through 3 next week. But basically it all boils down to this. There's only two kinds of people in the world. In a day and age where people are constantly trying to pit certain groups of people against other certain groups of people, the Bible's like, that's not how it works. We're all created in God's image. We're all connected. But there's really only two kinds of people in the world, and it has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. There's only two kinds of people in the world, the wise and the wicked. That's it. The wise... And what makes us wise is not that it's anything we did good. No, it's not. But the wise understand we can't save ourselves. Right. We can't save ourselves from our sin. We can't save ourselves from the junk that's happening in this world. And so we turn to Jesus. Right. And what does Jesus do? He, he purifies us. He refines us. He makes us white. He saves us. That's what Jesus does. That's what the wise understand. We're not wise because we're so good. We're wise because we're like, oh my goodness, we're so messed up. I need forgiveness. That's what, that's what sets us apart. However, the wicked, the wicked do not understand that. And therefore, they keep on acting wickedly. And so the question is, which group are you a part of? Are you part of the wise or are you part of the wicked? I've already talked a little bit about the 1,290 days and the 1,335 days in Daniel 12, 11 through 12, but what is their significance? Well, in Daniel 11, 2, or sorry, not Daniel, but Revelation, in Revelation 11, 2, we are told that the Gentiles or non-Jews will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years again. So that, that theme keeps repeating. That's why I'm pretty confident that saying a time, time, and half a time is three and a half years. There's just a lot of evidence pointing that direction, even though some disagree. But during that time, Revelation 11, 3 through 13, talks about two witnesses who will prophesy against this wicked world for 1,260 days, but then they are killed by the beast or the Antichrist. They'll be dead for three and a half days before they will be then resurrected and taken to heaven. Judgments then follow, but some give glory to God in heaven. Some get saved. And I bring this up to show 
that the uh, 1,260 days in Revelation indicates that a few more things happen after the two witnesses finish their ministry on earth. And so the way I look at it is 1,290 days occurring from the abomination of desolation, which again, that's the thing that stops sacrifices in the rebuilt Jewish temple. That's another thing we're looking for, is the temple to be rebuilt. Hasn't been yet, but the Bible indicates it will be. Um, until that time when the sacrifices are stopped in that rebuilt temple, uh, and the temple is cleansed in Daniel 12.12, 12, that 1,290 days seems to fit with what we know. Uh, the little bit bigger mystery is, what about these 1,335 days in Daniel 12.12? 12? Well, um, uh, why is someone blessed, or better yet, happy, yes, this is the Hebrew word asher, or asher again, just preached on the pursuit of happiness a few weeks ago. Uh, why will people be happy if they wait an additional 45 days? Well, the scripture does not say for certain, but more than likely, uh, these 45 days after the last half of the tribulation ends, those 45 days have something to do with the setting up of the millennial kingdom, the thousand years where Christ reigns on earth. And if you're a part of that, and all Christians will be, according to the book of Revelation, that's going to make you happy. That's going to make you happy. And so I, I think that's where the 1,335 days uh, comes in. That extra 45 days is like, we're kind of ramping up and getting geared up. We're going to be with Jesus ruling on earth like we're supposed to be. And that's going to be exciting. It's going to make us happy. In fact, Revelation 20 verse 6 says, Blessed, or guess what? It's actually happy again. Uh, uh, and you know, you know the funny thing is? I preached that sermon on happiness a couple weeks ago. And I didn't know this was coming up. I really didn't. I really didn't. But then, but then when I was, I was studying for this sermon and I was writing this, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's showing up again. It's like God winked at me or something. You know, <laughs> you know this is kind of cool. But it's that word, uh, the Greek one, makarios this time, but, but happy. It, it's really better uh, translated as happy. Happy and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's that millennial kingdom again. And then, of course, there's the eternal state after that. But that's another sermon for another day. But you have to love the way this ends, the hope that's here. Especially as we look at our last verse, chapter 12, verse 13 in Daniel. Again, this is the last prophecy that's given to Daniel. This is his retirement prophecy, if you will. It started in chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, and, and what was happening back then at the beginning of this prophecy. Daniel's mourning. He's been in a partial fast for three weeks. And, and why was that? Why was Daniel sad? He's not happy he's sad. Why is that? Well, it's because instead of getting to head home to the promised land with his fellow Jews, the Persian government is like, no, Daniel, you're too important to us here to the Persian government. You are not going home. In fact, we're moving you from Babylon to our new capital in Susa. So not only are you not going home, we're actually taking you even further away from home. And that's why he's sad. He's heading to the Tigris instead of the Euphrates. He's going east to Susa, according to Daniel 8.2. And so Daniel, who's now in his mid-80s, is very upset because he will never, he can tell, he can feel it in his bones, that he will never again return to the home that he was kidnapped from as a teenager. He's been wanting to go home ever since he was kidnapped as a teenager. He's never been able to get to go home. Finally, some of his people are getting to go home, and he can't. In fact, he's got to go further away from home. So he's bummed. That's how this prophecy started. Listen to how it ends. In Daniel 12, 13. But you, 
talking to Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall rest, and you will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Let's understand this. The rest here, it means the same thing as sleep in Daniel 12.12, 12, or sorry, Daniel 12.2, and that's not ordinary sleep. It refers to death. God is like, this is your retirement's prophecy. You're going to die soon. You're not going to go home right now like you want to. You're going to die. God is being honest with Daniel. He's not sugarcoating anything. Daniel's fear that he will never go back home before he dies is true. It's true. But God also shares this with him. All is not lost. All is not lost. Daniel, you will rise. You're going to die, but you will rise. Your dead body will one day stand again in life. And then... You'll get to go back home. You'll get your inheritance at the end of days. What a powerful promise to end with. You know, it's no secret, I've told you all this, I would absolutely love to go to Israel someday. Never been, in, never been to Israel. Would absolutely love to go to, to, to walk where Jesus walked, to see the things that the Bible talks about. I'd love it. I, I really would. I, I'd really, really, really like to go to Israel someday. But if I don't make it before I die, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be at peace. If I never make it to Israel, if I don't uh, you know, fulfill that part of my bucket list, it's okay. Why? Because I will join Daniel there in the resurrection. It's okay. If I don't get to go to Israel now, I'll go there in the resurrection. Actually, be better because I won't have to worry about terrorists. I won't have to worry about war. I won't have to worry about getting kidnapped or anything like that. You know, uh, so so maybe it is just better if I wait. You know, until then. But I'll get to go, and you know what? You will too. You ever want to go to Israel? I mean, I really should go to Israel before I die. If you don't, Jesus will take you there. In the end, uh, do you have that hope? Do you have the hope of everlasting life? You can have it. You just got to turn away from your sins and trust in Christ. And he will give you.